The forests of North America are dynamic landscapes of great diversity and charm, jogging moisture from the sky, draining its mountains, and shading its rivers. A complex process centuries in the making, and the role forests play in sustaining our planet is just being understood. At a time when the plants and animals dependent on a healthy forest are in grave danger. For more than 30 years, in 76 plots spread across six western states in British Columbia, scientists have measured that diversity in general forest health. Their findings are subtle, but alarming, and spread wide through all the plots. Tree mortality in these mixed forest systems is climbing rapidly, with no end in sight, and there are not enough young trees growing to replace the loss. There is nothing subtle about the current condition of the pine forests of Colorado where the mountain pine beetle has killed millions of trees over hundreds of thousands of acres. In just a few years, the landscape has gone from green to red to gray. These pine forests are particularly vulnerable because pine beetles prefer mature forests. And beetle outbreaks are especially deadly when the forest is thick with trees all about the same size and age. Also, warming temperatures and droughts can create stress in trees limiting their defense capabilities. Insects and disease have shaped trees since their war forests, and perhaps added to their vitality, much as predatory mammals, like wolves, have honed the instincts of prey, like elk. The rules have changed, though, and forests may not be able to live by the new rules. But what really is different is the climate, and with climate warming, beetles are moving into areas where uh, they never have been before in numbers that are really astounding. So what is going on is a native species that is acting as an invasive species. It's a native invasive species with what are going to be serious economic and ecological consequences that are really unknown because it hasn't happened before. This is a new experience. It has not happened before, at least not in the human experience. And if there is one challenge for all of us here, sharing the North American West, it is this. Without pine trees to shelter the snows, so vital to life everywhere, we will not have water when we need it. Almost all water in the West comes from high elevation snow, uh, melts in the spring and comes down. White bark pine and pine cover pine forest in the high country, tremendously important. Uh, with what happens later in the year with snow, snowfall, both the accumulation and the preservation of snow, but really in the, in the spring, this time of year, as the snow begins to melt, it's important that uh, it is attenuated over a fairly long period of time. And without the pine cover, without the forest cover, uh, it melts very quickly, you have a big flush that comes down. And then the, uh, the flows later in the, in the summer are much lower. You have problems with water temperature. And then it becomes really dry later on in the years. The effect of lower summer flow really impacted water temperatures. And uh, trout and many of the really premier trout streams were stressed and to the point that there were large die-off of trout. At about 70 degrees, trout become really stressed. And temperatures above that, they start to die. In regions most affected by global warming, trout and salmon populations will be slashed by 50% or more. Many trout species, already listed as threatened or endangered, will become increasingly vulnerable to extinction. So if we lose these systems, it's not just going to be important in the high country, all the way down to the valley floors. We have the impacts of the loss of this critical ecosystem. Animals all through the ecosystem will be impacted. The red squirrels will have fewer seeds, as will the Clark's nutcracker. The grizzly will produce less offspring. The trout will die from above average water temperatures. And the river otter will have less fish to eat. The whole ecosystem will be affected. Pine forests of the West often fit this description. Because we have suppressed fire, a natural force that renews them and changes their age structure, creating a mosaic of various sizes of trees. Forests like these digest more than 50% of our CO2 emissions. They are more vital to us than what they become at the lumberyard. 
all these dead forests are no longer doing their work as a carbon sink. So it is a great misfortune that they actually emit carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere in their death throes, much like they do when they burn. Fire is better understood now, and historically, forests have benefited from its process, well illustrated in the country burned by the great 1988 fires of Yellowstone. The Yellowstone ecosystem is a big place, with a volcanic caldera set atop two million acres of geysers, mountains, rivers, lakes, and even an abundance of wildlife. Covering most all of its land mass is a high elevation pine or spruce forest, places for elk to hide in shade for the headwaters of the Yellowstone River, our longest free-flowing large stream. As a place where natural systems have been allowed to run their course, Yellowstone is not only a big backyard for millions of visitors, but a laboratory where we can study the processes of change, like fire, predator and prey, and climate. In a place as pristine and far removed as the Yellowstone Plateau, one would think nature could remain unfettered, each year bringing flowers and calf elk to the meadow, spawning trout to the streams, and hungry bears out of a winter's sleep. But change is coming to Yellowstone. Change, perhaps greater than any since the eruption of the great volcano that formed the plateau. For 15 years, Dr. Jesse Logan has been a group leader and researcher with the US Forest Service Pine Beetle Project. Watching and measuring the changes in the higher reaches of the park give him great concern for the entire ecosystem. This is like the rooftop of the continent. It truly is the rooftop of the continent, and it's like a house. If you remove the rooftop, uh, you really don't have a usable structure. And if you remove the rooftop of the continent, uh, those high elevation forests, the ramifications are really important for all that, uh, that makes this place so special and so important. This little limber pine behind me, this little red limber pine has been uh, hit and killed by the mountain pine beetle. And it's one tree of literally millions or maybe billions, who knows, of pine trees that have been killed in the last few years by the mountain pine beetle. Large outbreaks are not unusual in species like lodgepole pine, but in the high country above us, there's something very different going on. And it's very much related to the warming temperatures that begin in the western United States uh, sometime in the mid-70s, really. Typically, the uh, environment and weather and climate in those high elevations was just too tough on the beetle. It couldn't make a living up there, but all that's changed. The mountain pine beetle is a really indistinct little insect that easily on the tip of your little finger. And you might ask how an insect this small could kill a, a pine tree. Well, the, the secret is in numbers. Literally thousands of beetles attack a pine tree at about the same time over a very short period of time. And although many pines like lodgepole and ponderosa pine are well defended uh, in their resin capacity of the tree to uh, either flush out or actually produce toxins that, uh, that kill the, the eggs and larvae of the beetle, if enough beetles attack a tree over a short enough period of time, it exhausts the uh, tree defenses and it kills the tree. As the female excavates this egg gallery, she uh, lays eggs along the side, and each of these is uh, evidence of a, of a larvae, a new beetle, uh, that uh, is being produced by this one pair as the female continues her egg gallery up the tree. The white bark pine has not developed chemical defenses in the same sense as other pines have, so they really aren't well defended from attacks by the mountain pine beetle. Much fewer beetles are required to kill the tree and successfully reproduce. And in fact, the beetle has to kill the tree to successfully reproduce. It's a win-lose situation. Thousands of acres of white bark pine, the foundation species of the high, highest forests, are being killed by mountain pine beetle. And these pines, this ecosystem, 
is not at all like a lodgepole pine ecosystem. It's not a disturbance regenerated species in the same sense that lodgepole is. And because they haven't co-evolved with the beetle, they're just sitting ducks, they're uh, defenses. Lodgepole pine has really effective chemical defenses uh, against the mountain pine beetle, not true with white bark. And not only that, typically uh, winter and particularly cold spring and fall temperatures would kill maybe 80 or 90 percent of the beetle brood, so that would keep the population in check. But with the temperatures that are occurring now, two things happen. One is there's enough heat increment in the summer at these high elevation uh, environments that the, the complete life cycle is uh, completed in one year, where formerly with more uh, historically typical uh, climatic patterns, it would take two years in the high elevation forest. And secondly, you're not getting the killing temperatures in uh, in winter or, or fall and, and spring. So instead of maybe two or three percent at high elevation of the population surviving, maybe 60 or 70 percent survives. And they can kill a tree in just six weeks. Large populations of beetles are surviving and they make it through the year for a coordinated attack and we are really seeing the impact in the high elevation systems. And the white bark pine is not only a foundation, but it's called a keystone species, and that's because it has such far-ranging impacts on uh, wildlife. In the greater Yellowstone, particularly in the fall, white bark pine cones that are cached by red squirrels are really the only game in town for the grizzly bear at a critical time when it has to put on uh, fat and nutrients to get it across uh, the winter hibernation period. And in fact, if sows do not have enough nutrition at this time of the year, they'll reabsorb the eggs. It's, it has a real impact. In Canada, millions of acres of dead trees makes the scale even more breathtaking from a planetary standpoint and the landscape much more red. There's an area in Canada, 13 million hectares in lodgepole pine that's been killed by mountain pine beetle. So uh, for those of you who are, uh, you know, metrically challenged, that's like 32, 33 million acres of forest that's been killed over a very short period of time by this beetle. Additionally, North America's burial forest is a 600 mile wide band of pine woodlands that stretches from Alaska across Canada all the way to Newfoundland. It has 20% of the Earth's wild forests 20% of its fresh waters, which is purified by forest systems, and 50% of the global population of 40 species. With warming temperatures, the boreal is showing signs of stress, and the boreal is primarily made up of jack pines that have no defense to the pine beetle. And the one thing that is common across this large, huge geographic area is a warming climate uh, resulting from uh, the global warming directly related to our production of greenhouse gases. We go to our forests to hear birds, to see elk, or maybe just to find quiet. By 2013, some 80% of our western pine forests will be gone. For how long, we do not know. If the great northern burial forests suffer the same fate, a swath of our continent, 600 miles wide and 4,000 miles across, will no longer be a part of our landscape, creating a silence never heard before.